All right, and sorry guys, we didn't get the uh, all the marketing stuff out early enough, so we don't have a huge attendance, and I'm not sure how many questions we have. No worries. Yeah. That's my fault, by the way. Uh, let's see. He said, Brian says, I just tried it, and it said the channel is closed. I don't know what he's referring to. Let's see. Lee says, I've been meaning to ask this question for a while. At any rate, as seawater and mammal blood has a salinity of around 3.5%, what is the salinity of plant sap? Is it higher for healthy plants or less than healthy plants? Well, first, kudos for the connection bet between seawater and uh, mammal blood. I'm, I'm also aware without proof uh, and in generalization that the mineral balance is, is quite similar as well, which is, is really interesting to note. Um, but I, I don't know uh, what a healthy plant would be. Um, I, I think, you know, one way you could look at it is from a, a, a perspective of bricks, which is typically talked about as the sugars of the plant sap. So I'm not really sure how to convert that and, and how it would reconcile, but, um, you know, it's bricks is also can be an indirect, uh, you know, most of the time it's accurate, but it can also be an indirect uh, association. It's possible to uh, create a, a higher BRICS in, environment uh, by in, inducing that through min uh, specific mineralization. I think it's potassium. Um, but point being is, you know, to try to answer your question, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, to be honest with you. All right. Hey, do you mind uh, stopping your screen share? Oh, no, not at all. That works. Yeah. Ben asks, why is actinovate no longer available in California? Well, I think uh, if I was still have my garden center, I'd probably have a better answer. But I think it's because California is posturing to be its own country. Um, you know, they they do things a little bit differently. You know, they've got cancer warnings on organic potting soil bags. So. I, I don't know. Uh, I do know that it's not a matter of resources because it's owned by, uh, you know, one of those Bayer Syngenta companies. So not really sure other than California, you know, and I, I should, shouldn't pick on them. I, I think they're just looking a little bit closer and they do happen to be, you know, have a higher agricultural output than most countries in the world. So, uh, you know, it's, it's probably just from paying attention. I'm not aware of anything from Actinovate that would be controversial because it is a natural uh, born organism, um, but I'd have to look into that, man. I don't know. I know California is really strict on bringing like animals, fruits, vegetables into California because they are, they're, you know, they rely so much on their agricultural. Yeah. Hawaii wins that contest. You know, they, they if you ever been to Hawaii, I went one time and they have signs, you can't bring plants to soil and that kind of thing. And it's understandable because of how remote and isolated they are. They do a lot of genetic uh, GMO research out there as well for the same reason, because they're so sequestered, which is kind of paradise, but it's also being destroyed on some levels. But yeah, California is real careful. I, I have to deal when, when we distribute products, we have to register. Uh, it's kind of a remnant of where we come from. There's 50 different state agricultural uh, uh, organizations and you can't just go to one organization to register your product. You have to do it 50 times. And you always go to California first, because if you can get it right there, you can get it right anywhere, you know. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're fairly particular. Let's see, we got some comments here. Ben says, we might call this realistic farming. Just heard a TED talk about a blind astrophysicist who has studied the sounds of the cosmos and translated various waves of energy into sound much like we do with light in those amazing radio wave pictures of galaxies. Wow, that's it's maybe referencing somewhat of the cymatics thing we looked at too, you know, I, again, you know, form follows frequency. That's kind of a mantra of mine. Uh, feel free to share the TED talk, man. Ben says, the proof of trace mineralization may be in cultures that eat anadromous fish like salmon and seaweeds high in micronutrients. Yeah, yeah, I think that's safe to say, you know, and what's really interesting is to look at native populations, which is very few left, you know, that, that book, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, 
it's really a good read on, on, on that front then because it was probably, I think it was the 1920s, 1930s, and he was a dentist and traveled the world and sourced isolated communities, particularly where like part of the community, it was the same genetic stock, but you know, the people at the port had met the white man in, in modern human and the people over the mountain hadn't. And what he did is compared their bone structure and their tooth development towards their diet. And in every instance, the people that had been associated with the sugar and the white flour that was brought based on the price point uh, for the modern diet, that were experiencing de de degeneration. And he goes even further to start comparing these native people that hadn't been exposed to it, and what type of diet they had. You might have, you know, the Inuits eating, you know, uh, blubber from seals and things like that. And that's 90% of their diet. <clears throat> and then you might have the Huns of people that are, you know, more vegetarian and, and drinking the, the Himalayan spring water and, and this kind of thing. So they had completely fundamentally separate diets. And what he tried to do through his effort was deduce what was it? What was the X factor in all of these native and populations diets that gave them health? And uh, it's, man, it, it's really, uh, I think it's the last time on earth that research could have been done. It's, it's really a, a gem. Ben says, I've lived around Yorick and Macaw Res, and they have had catastrophic health problems from diet change. Some yeah, it's in the South Pacific. Yeah, I mean, if we're not experiencing the same thing, right? It's uh, and if I, I don't, I'm not sure how that doesn't scream at us in the way that it screams at, at, at those of us that are paying attention to it. It's just a, it's a real burden of proof, you know, and it's a, it's a real chore to try to get to the powers that be. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I always think about it in terms of like, you know, let's look at our, our government, and when you have a like a president give like a, a joint session speech to Congress on healthcare and never once mentions the word food. Uh, you know, if that doesn't tell you everything, I don't, I don't know what does. It's, it's pretty alarming how, how far off base we've gotten. Sue says, uh, I've used frequency to rid my house of insects, fruit flies in particular. Oh, please do tell how, how did, you, if you can, because that's, man, if you've gotten fruit flies, if you have like a kitchen composter or something like that, my, my strategy is, you know, the vinegar and the vial and, uh, you know, a vacuum cleaner, basically. So if you got something else, man, I'm all for it. All right. She's got a, a little bit of a delay, but uh, we'll look for an answer. Cool. Uh, let's see. Steven says, brilliant video. Cymatics is super interesting. Maybe helps explain why different music makes us feel differently. We made a Kladni uh, plate. For the Autopot Summer Festival last year, it was amazing. Huh. Absolutely, it does. And look into uh, Masura Emoto and the difference in, uh, you know, Beethoven versus like hate music and the influence on the crystallization of water. There's a lot of different ways into the same place. It's it's really fascinating. And 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 frankly, the translation of emotion from frequency and music, right? I mean, you know, I spend time with my kids and I'm trying to show them, you know, music that influenced me when I was little and it's it so crazy, man, to think back at those formative, you know, like listening to, to some Zeppelin or something, you know, when you first found it as a kid and you're showing, you know, your five-year-old and you're sitting there and you feel, you know, 10 years old and, you know, how it takes you back and, and creates emotion is uh, absolutely on the right track there, man. I, I appreciate that sentiment. Well, we've also used music throughout history to tell stories, to save, you know, to for so multiple generations later, we'll be able to use those stories to uh, save their lives. And there's, um, I think I talked about this before that uh, Bill Mollison talked about it, it was uh, some tribe that was, they, they traveled the oceans and they would have someone, they would sing and have someone lay with their ear on the boat, on the, at the bottom of the boat um and they would listen to the tide and the waves and they were able to navigate doing that i want to i want to find that story because i tried to tell someone about that and i probably butchered it because you did that's that's so cool man i mean yeah that's you know i think my response was the the aborigines in the walkabout right and kind of same principle the walkabout was telling a story not so much maybe it was music but you know they basically told a story that reconciled with the landscape 
So it was the way in which they retained the information and passed it down. When you went on your walkabout, you basically were ready to go tell the story of the land. And as you walked the land and told the story, you knew where to find the water in the middle of the desert, you know? Um, so yeah, man, we've, we've lost all of that other than the remnants and the emotion of it. But uh, that's, that's really cool to talk about. It's interesting how uh, a lot of tribes have their, you know, their step into manlyhood or, you know, it's like, uh, like yeah, and the walkabout. I th I think that also happens kind of in your your 12, 13 years is when you first kind of get into that. So you're told all these stories to lead up to it so that you can survive it. Mm -hmm. And it's like as soon as you start becoming a pesky kid about that age, right? Puberty, it's like time to go, buddy. Go, go <laughs> learn everything you learn. Get out of here. Let's see if you can make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but it probably did a lot for their culture, right? Because after having all that pent up energy and uh that's kind of when you become cocky and um and to be sent out on your own to survive could be really humbling for uh people and and having them separate from the culture would really affect the culture in general yeah yeah no it, it's and cool no, how it all makes sense in that regard that, that's that's awesome well we wouldn't have things like uh you wouldn't have you probably wouldn't have people you know you you get those old guys yelling at the kids in the gas station or whatever like or because their music's too loud or you know whatever driving down the lawn and a lot of that stuff would go away yeah yeah it's true right <laughs> of course we'd have a lot of kids dying too so you know it depends how good a storytelling they got okay <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, ben says, I believe the TED Talk was on podcast five senses. Hmm. I'll try okay. to Google that. We'll see. If Google's pretty smart. <laughs> I just started trying BTI. What's BTI? That's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. That's, uh, man, maybe an aside, but not really. BT is not a soil borne organism. It was, as I've been told, found in the gut of a microbe in a, uh, the gut of a moth in a cave in Brazil in like the 1970s. And they isolated it. And uh, it's what comes in those little mosquito dunks. If you ever seen them, you can throw them in your pond and it creates yeah. bacteria on the surface. And when the mosquito comes to breathe, it gets them. Um, and so there's another one, BT uh, K, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki. And the Kristaki is typically sold to attack larval stages like caterpillars. Um, BT affects the larval stage. And that's what we genetically modified crops with these genes so that it expressed in the plant rather than through a spray, which, you know, is incredible that that can even be done. Um, but the point of it is when the pest ingests the protein, it, it, it uh, mitigates the, lar the larval stage. Um, so what that is, is basically an identification of the ability of the same microbe, kind of like you and I are people, and I may be a basketball player and you may be a soccer player, and how would we know that looking through a microscope, right? And, and it begs the conversation of, you know, one, we're never going to figure out, figure out the true ability in microbes, but that is a perfect explanation as to, to how that works, you know? How many different Kirstaki Israelis strains are there for all of the, you know, 95% of bacteria and, um, you know, 90% of fungi that we haven't found yet based on the rate of discovery. It's just, you know, like, it's, it's amazing. But I, I actually use that as an example of, you know, we talk a lot about um, the strength of microbes. You can't measure it. You know, it's not like we can set them up on a bench press and say, go, you know, you, you, you just look at them, they look the same. But how do you evaluate the ability of microbes? And one of the benefits of, of biodynamic composting, for example, or static composting, where you're not turning the pile and making it easy for the microbe, which the extreme to that is the lab derived microbes that are given abundant food sources, no predators, they got no life experience, right? So you can have a lab based microbe and a biodynamic microbe and on paper they're the exact same thing, but one's far and away better than the other. And how do you even get to measuring that outside of just adopting the truth within that concept and then applying it to see for yourself? You know, it's like, a, like the difference between a, an animal in the zoo versus an animal left in the wild. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we've taken the life force out of it and the life experience. Uh, absolutely. We're good at that. You know, so now we need to get to, you know, getting back to some faith in, in, in how it works, uh, in, in my humble opinion. 
All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. It's every week except next week. We're taking next week off because I am going to Blues Fest, and uh, and you've got some other stuff to do. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll be back the next week after that. And I hope you enjoy the show. Twenty nine bucks a year to support the show. That's pretty inexpensive, I think. You can find that at tv.permethos.com. Just look for Progressive Farming. All right, guys. Have a great week. Rock out at your con- at your. Uh... Concert there, man. All right. Thanks. Yep. See you guys. Bye. Bye.